Welcome to part six of the Unsolved Mysteries Iceberg, where we explore dark and fascinating mysteries. On this iceberg, we deep dive unsolved mysteries, including true crime, myths and legends, strange events, cryptids, urban legends, internet mysteries, and more. Let's go down this rabbit hole together. The Disappearance of Jennifer Kessie. In January 2006, the disappearance of Jennifer Kessie shocked Orlando, Florida. Jennifer, a 24-year-old financial analyst, vanished without a trace, leaving behind a perplexing mystery spanning two decades. Jennifer Kessie was last seen on the evening of January 23, 2006. She had recently purchased a condo in Orlando and was known for her reliability and strong work ethic. And when Jennifer failed to show up for work on January 24th and didn't respond to calls, her family and friends immediately knew something was wrong. A missing persons report was filed and the search for Jennifer began. Her car, a black Chevy Malibu, was found two days later at a nearby apartment complex, providing the only significant clue to her disappearance. Surveillance footage from the complex showed a person parking Jennifer's car and walking away. Unfortunately, the individual's identity was obscured. Despite extensive efforts, this individual has never been identified. Several theories have emerged with respect to Jennifer Kessie's disappearance. The first theory suggests that Jennifer was abducted by someone she knew, possibly someone from her personal or professional life. This theory is supported by the lack of forced entry into her condo and her car being found in a condition that suggested a hurried attempt to hide it. Her ex-boyfriend and then current boyfriend were both examined as suspects, but were quickly ruled out. A manager at her workplace was also extensively investigated after it turned out he had made numerous advances on her and desired a relationship with her. Kessie was in a relationship and not interested whatsoever in this manager, leading the police to believe he may have had a motive to commit an act against her. However, he too was quickly ruled out as a suspect. A second theory points to a construction worker or workers. At the time of her disappearance, Jennifer's condo complex was undergoing extensive renovations, and she had expressed discomfort about the workers to her family and friends. The theory suggests that someone who had access to her daily routines could have seized an opportunity to abduct her, perhaps in connection to a human trafficking ring. The third and broader theory involves a random act of violence by a stranger. However, while this is possible, there is no evidence to support the theory. Bible John, the serial killer of Glasgow. Bible John, a name that still strikes fear into the heart of Glasgow, Scotland, refers to an unidentified serial slayer linked to the deaths of three women in the late 1960s. The moniker originates from the killer's alleged quoting of the Bible during his encounters with victims, leading to a media frenzy and a manhunt. The only link between the slayings was a nightclub called the Barrowland Ballroom, and the description of a well-spoken, smartly dressed man given by witnesses who saw the victims on the nights of their disappearances. Patricia Docker, a 25-year-old nursing auxiliary, was the first victim, last seen alive on February 23, 1968. Her body was discovered the following morning, not far from her home, hidden from view. She had met her end by way of strangling. The second victim, Jemima McDonald, a 32-year-old mother of three, met a similar fate after a night at the Barrowland on August 16, 1969. Her disappearance sparked rumors among the local community, leading to the grim discovery of her body in an abandoned building. Like Patricia, Jemima had been strangled. The final known victim, Helen Puttick, also 29, attended the Barrowland Ballroom on October 31, 1969. Helen's body was found the next day in the backyard of her apartment. The brutal nature of her slaying, combined with a witness account from her sister, who had shared a taxi with Helen, and the mysterious man, provided the most detailed description of the slayer. 
Over the years, several suspects have been considered, with one of the most notable being Peter Tobin. Tobin, a convicted serial killer, came into focus due to similarities between his known crimes and the Bible John slayings, including his suspected presence in Glasgow at the time of the killings and his resemblance to the composite sketches of the suspect. However, conclusive evidence linking Tobin to the Bible John slayings has never been found and may never be due to improper storage of DNA evidence from the slayings. Further, the police no longer consider him a suspect and have since come to have doubts that he actually lived in Glasgow at the time of the slayings, partly due to evidence of Tobin's wife, who has cooperated with police in relation to Tobin's crimes. Numerous other suspects have been considered. However, at present, all major candidates for Bible John have been cleared by the authorities. Elizabeth Bathory, the Vampire Countess. Elizabeth Bathory, often dubbed as the most prolific female serial killer in history, remains a figure shrouded in mystery and controversy. Born into a high noble family in 1560 in Hungary, her life story has transcended the realm of mere historical biography to become a legend intertwined with tales of horror and bloodlust. Yet, amidst this sensationalism, a critical question arises. Was Elizabeth Bathory a monstrous killer, or the victim of one of the greatest historical frame jobs of all time? Bathory's infamy is primarily linked to the alleged gruesome slaying of hundreds of young women. According to historical records, she was accused of committing heinous acts of violence, with testimonies from survivors and witnesses painting a grim picture of her cruelty. The stories suggest that Bathory's crimes were not only motivated by sadism, but also by a belief that the blood of virgins could preserve her youth and beauty. The quote-unquote trial of Elizabeth Bathory was notably unconventional, even by the standards of the 17th century. She was never formally tried in court herself, nor was she allowed to defend herself against the accusations. Two trials were held of her supposed accomplices, in which it was claimed that the Countess killed up to 650 young ladies. These trials were not thorough by any means, taking a total of two days between them. Yes, two days, for a trial allegedly involving up to 650 slayings. The evidence against her was largely gathered through testimony extracted from the torture of her servants, who were accused of being her accomplices. This method of evidence collection casts a massive and overriding shadow of doubt over the veracity of the claims. Furthermore, there were no bodies found at her castle to corroborate the staggering number of victims she was accused of slaying. As a result of these legal proceedings, she was confined to her castle for the rest of her life. There is significant evidence to suggest that Bathory was the victim of a conspiracy. Upon the death of her husband, she expanded her already sprawling estates in Hungary. This was problematic as Bathory was Protestant, while the Habsburg king of Hungary, Matthias, was Catholic. Further, Matthias was also deeply indebted to Bathory, a problem which was solved by the accusations against her. All that said, Bathory is still frequently thought of as one of the most prolific serial slayers of all time, despite all the evidence against this view. The Biting Nuns The phenomenon known as the Biting Nun Mass Hysteria emerged in the 15th century in Germany, later spreading throughout Europe. It all started with one nun's inexplicable urge to bite her peers, a contagion that swiftly infected her convent, leading to a widespread outbreak of similar incidents among the nuns. Analysts suggest that the convent's restrictive and severe setting, along with the psychological and societal strains borne by the nuns, might have triggered this hysteria. Thus, the biting incidents can be seen as a manifestation of the underlying stress and suppressed emotions within the cloistered communities. Occurring in a period when the comprehension of mental health was rudimentary at best, 
Such actions were often or always attributed to religious or superstitious causes. The prevalent belief systems of the time might have construed the nun's behavior as demonic possession or a divine challenge, rather than recognizing it as a psychological distress signal. However, there is a school of thought that challenges the event altogether. The first documented attestation of the Biting Nuns event comes from the Enlightenment era in the 18th century. This was famously a time when European intellectuals sought to distance themselves from superstitious worldviews and adopt rational outlooks on the world. Under this theory, the event may have been fabricated to portray religious institutions as oppressive and non-scientific. However, just because our first attestation of the event is in the 18th century, doesn't mean this individual wasn't working from earlier sources, which have now been lost. The Blind River Killer. The Blind River Killer is an individual who committed heinous acts for no discernible reason in June 1991. In June 1991, Gord and Jackie McAllister, a couple from Lindsay, Ontario, embarked on a cross-Canada vacation to visit relatives. Their trip took a tragic turn at the Blind River rest stop in Ontario when, in the early hours of June 28, they encountered a man claiming to be a police officer who forced his way into their camper with the intent to rob and kill them. Despite complying and handing over their valuables, Jackie was fatally shot by the assailant, and Gord, although injured, survived the ordeal. Brian Donald Major was also present at the rest stop at the same time. For reasons which are entirely unknown, he was also slain by the Blind River Killer. However, given the circumstances, no account has survived as to what took place between the Blind River Killer and Major. A former police officer who is presently serving life for unrelated slayings is speculated to be the Blind River Killer. However, at present, the case remains unsolved. The West Mesa Slayings The West Mesa Slayings are one of New Mexico's most chilling unsolved crimes. Discovered in 2009 in Albuquerque, New Mexico, the remains of 11 women were found buried on the West Mesa, an undeveloped stretch of land within the city limits. The victims were largely involved in illicit activities and disappeared between 2001 and 2005. These slayings are suspected to have been the work of a serial killer nicknamed the West Mesa Bone Collector. The grim discovery was made accidentally by a woman walking her dog, leading to a massive police investigation. Over the course of a year, the remains of the 11 women were excavated. Despite extensive forensic efforts, the cause of death for the victims could not be determined, largely because of the advanced state of decomposition. The Albuquerque Police Department launched what would become one of the largest investigations in the state's history, involving local, state, and federal agencies. Several theories have emerged over the years, ranging from the involvement of a lone serial killer to multiple perpetrators working together. Some theories suggest that the murders were the work of a truck driver serial killer, given the proximity of the burial site to Interstate 40, a major east-west route across the United States. Others speculate about the involvement of gangs or cartels, given the victims' connections to drugs and the high level of violence associated with these groups. Several suspects have been investigated over the years, however, two are considered most likely. One of the early suspects was Lorenzo Montoya, who lived less than three miles from the burial site. Montoya had a history of violence towards women and was killed in 2006 after strangling a woman he had hired for her services. However, her quote-unquote boyfriend intervened and fatally shot him over the strangling incident. No direct evidence has linked Montoya to the West Mesa murders and his death before the bodies were discovered means that many questions remain unanswered. Interestingly, proponents of this theory point out that Montoya died in 2006, and the last body in the West Mesa was put there in 2005. 
Another person of interest is Joseph Blee, a local Albuquerque resident with a long criminal history, including a significant history of convictions in relation to SA offenses. Blee came to the attention of investigators because of his known activity in the area where the victims disappeared and his criminal background. In 2015, he was sentenced to 38 years on unrelated charges in relation to heinous acts. Police have found circumstantial evidence linking Blee to the slayings, but nothing concrete. The Kidnapping of Shergar Shergar, a celebrated Irish racehorse, became an international sensation, not just for his accomplishments on the race course, but also due to his mysterious disappearance in 1983. Born in 1978, Shergar was known for his remarkable speed and agility, winning the 1981 Epsom Derby by a record margin of 10 lengths, an achievement that remains unmatched. Owned by the Aga Khan, a prominent figure in thoroughbred racing, Shergar's career was illustrious, earning him numerous accolades and making him one of the most valuable stallions at stud at the time of his kidnapping. After the record win at the Epsom Derby, this Irish stallion was valued at a massive 10 million pounds in 1981. Adjusted for inflation, Shergar was valued at nearly 40 million pounds in 2024 values. On the evening of February 8, 1983, a group of armed men broke into the Ballymany Stud in County Kildare, Ireland, where Shergar was housed. The assailants, masked and wielding firearms, kidnapped the horse, holding the stud's head groom at gunpoint. The event sparked a massive search operation and led to widespread media coverage, turning the case into one of the most notorious animal kidnappings of the 20th century. Theories and suspects surrounding Shergar's disappearance are varied, but the most prominent theory involves the Irish Republican Army, better known as the IRA. It is widely speculated that the IRA orchestrated the kidnapping as part of an effort to secure funding for their operations. The theory is supported by several pieces of circumstantial evidence and later claims by individuals allegedly involved with the IRA. However, despite extensive investigations, no one was ever officially charged in relation to the crime and the IRA has never admitted involvement. Other theories suggest that the kidnapping was the work of a criminal gang unaffiliated with any political organization, possibly international, who saw the value in Shergar as a ransom target. However, these theories have not been as thoroughly substantiated as the IRA involvement hypothesis. Despite efforts by authorities and private investigators, the case gradually grew cold with no significant breakthroughs. Shergar's fate remains a mystery. The consensus among investigators and those close to the case is that the horse was likely unfortunately slain by his kidnappers shortly after the abduction, possibly due to the inability to control such a high-profile animal or to negotiate a successful ransom. However, others have speculated that upon the failure of negotiations, the horse may have been sold to an unscrupulous breeder. In my view, I don't see this as a meaningful possibility, as in this case, Shergar would likely have had a large number of offspring who would now be connected by DNA to his known progeny. This theory in essence requires a closed system where the post-kidnapping progeny would never be let out into the general racehorse population. Theus, the werewolf of God. Theus of Kaltenbrunn, often known by the monikers the Livonian Werewolf, or the Werewolf of God, was a man whose life and subsequent disappearance are, to put it mildly, cinematic. He hailed from Livonia, present-day Latvia, and Estonia, a region steeped in folklore and superstition. The 17th century was a tumultuous period in European history, characterized by religious upheaval, witch hunts, and a deep fascination with the supernatural. It was against this backdrop that Thies's story unfolded, with extraordinary claims and the mysterious circumstances surrounding his disappearance. Thies's story is particularly notable for his trial in 1692, where instead of denying accusations of witchcraft, 
as was common, he boldly proclaimed himself to be a werewolf as his defense. However, his version of lycanthropy diverged sharply from the malevolent creatures of lore. Theus claimed that he and other werewolves were warriors of God, venturing into hell three times a year to battle the devil and his witches, thereby ensuring a bountiful harvest for their communities. This assertion flipped the script on traditional werewolf mythology, portraying these beings not as feared predators and allies of Satan, but as protectors working for the greater good. The penalties associated with both witchcraft and lycanthropy during this period were, to be frank, draconian. Either of these offenses was sufficient to warrant execution. The judges at his trial accepted that he was, factually, a werewolf, but found that he was not a servant of the devil and had been actively working against the forces of Satan and his witches. That said, as they say, rules are rules, so the judges sentenced him to flogging and banishment. This was, of course, an extremely minor punishment for an accused witch who admitted to being a werewolf. Some believe that Thies actually did transform into a werewolf and did go to hell to fight witches and the devil. Support for this theory comes from the fact that his quote-unquote defense to witchcraft was that he committed another equally bad capital crime. Proponents of this theory question why anyone under such a legal system would try to defend themselves by admitting to something so outlandish and dangerous if it wasn't true. Further, proponents note that the judges at the trial made a factual finding that Thies was a werewolf indicating that the evidence must have led them strongly to this conclusion. In response, critics of the theory argue that Thies was accused of being a witch, and there was evidence of him conducting blessings without invoking the name of God. Given this, he likely would have been found guilty of witchcraft and ended, and as such, he had nothing to lose by fabricating, a story which didn't exonerate him on the basis that he was not a witch but rather on the basis that his actions were justified. After being banished, Thies disappears from the historical record. Some point to this as a mysterious disappearance, supporting the fact that perhaps he was a werewolf and returned to his pack. More grounded explanations assert that Thies was only of historical note due to the trial, and there was no reason for any record to exist of him either before the trial or after. Also, Netflix, please make a show about Thies, thanks. The Red Baron The Red Baron, Manfred Albrecht Freiherr von Richthofen, remains perhaps the most legendary figure in the history of aerial combat. Born on May 2, 1892, in Breslau, now located in Poland, Richthofen became a pilot in the German Air Force during World War I. He is credited with 80 air combat victories, making him the war's top-scoring ace. His nickname stems from the fact that he painted his plane a bright red, and also from the fact that he was, legitimately, a baron. Richthofen's fame stems from his extraordinary skill as a pilot and tactician, his role in developing aerial combat tactics, and his leadership of the Flying Circus. The Flying Circus was composed of several of Germany's top fighters, who painted their aircraft in bright colors, leading to their circus nickname. The Red Baron's exploits quickly became legendary, contributing to his mythos both during his life and posthumously. The mystery surrounding the Red Baron's death on April 21, 1918, adds a significant layer to his legend. While flying over vaux sur in France, he was shot down and killed. The controversy lies in who fired the fatal shot. Two primary theories exist. One credits the shot to a machine gunner on the ground, while the other attributes it to a fighter pilot. The ground fire theory posits that Australian machine gunner Sergeant Cedric Popkin was responsible for the fatal shot. Richthofen was pursuing a Canadian pilot, Lieutenant Wilfred May, at low altitude making him vulnerable to ground fire. Popkin, positioned for an ideal shot as the Red Baron flew past, likely had the opportunity and angle to hit the Baron. 
Forensic analyses and examinations of the bullet trajectory support this theory, suggesting that the bullet came from the ground. The second theory credits Canadian pilot Captain Arthur Roy Brown with shooting the Red Baron down. Brown was engaged in the dogfight, attempting to protect May from the Red Baron. He fired at Richthofen from a challenging position, and it was initially believed that Brown's gunfire brought the Red Baron down, earning Brown official credit for the victory. However, several factors complicate attributing the victory to Brown. The angle of the shot, the distance, and the maneuvers involved make it less likely that Brown's fire was the cause. Furthermore, the nature of the Baron's wounds suggests a bullet that traveled upward through his body, more consistent with ground fire than an aerial attack. No definitive conclusion has been reached, and it's likely that the mystery will never be fully solved. However, at this point, even though Brown is still officially credited with the victory, the vast majority of historians no longer accept this claim. Further, during the war, there was a strong propagandistic incentive to portray the Red Baron as being felled in aerial combat rather than by a machine gunner on the ground. Bill and Peggy Stevenson. This case was suggested in the comments of a previous video by a subscriber named The Slim Slayer. Thanks for bringing this disturbing case to my attention. Also, quick aside, if your suggestion makes it into a future video, you'll get a shout out as well. So leave suggestions in the comments below. In late May 2011, the quiet town of Florence, Kentucky, was shaken by a gruesome discovery that quickly escalated into one of the state's most perplexing unsolved slayings. Bill and Peggy Stevenson, both in their mid-70s, were found dead in their home over the Memorial Day weekend, launching an investigation that, despite extensive efforts, has yet to yield a conclusive resolution. Bill, a well-regarded truck driver, and Peggy, a devoted church nursery worker, were deeply embedded in their community, particularly within their local church. Their commitment to their faith and community service made the news of their death not only shocking, but profoundly incomprehensible to those who knew them. The Stevensons were last seen alive at a service at the Union Baptist Church, where they were regular attendees and active members. The discovery of their bodies was made by a relative who grew concerned after the couple failed to show up for church on Sunday, which was highly unusual for the devout pair. Upon entering their home, the relative was met with a scene that suggested a violent struggle had taken place. Both Bill and Peggy had been subjected to what can only be categorized as an extremely brutal attack. While the full details of the crime scene have not been released due to the ongoing nature of the investigation. What has been released is that the bodies were quote unquote posed and the rooms in the house were quote unquote staged. Further, investigators have confirmed that a message was left by the perpetrator, though again, due to the ongoing nature of the investigation, no further details were released. The manner of their slaying suggested a level of personal animosity, yet despite exhaustive investigations, no motive has clearly been established and no suspects have been identified. The investigation into the Stevenson slayings was extensive and thorough, with local police working in conjunction with state and federal agencies. Forensic evidence was collected from the scene, including DNA samples, but this has not led to a breakthrough in the case. Over the years, several theories have emerged, ranging from a random act of violence to a targeted killing, possibly connected to Bill's work or their community activities. However, none of these theories have solidified into a concrete lead. Further, their home showed no signs of forced entry, suggesting that they may have known the person who committed this heinous crime. The extinction of the Paraceratherium. Paraceratherium, often cited as the largest land mammal to have ever lived, roamed the earth during the Oligocene epoch, approximately 34 to 23 million years ago. This prehistoric giant, 
belonging to the family of hornless rhinoceroses, stood nearly 16 feet tall at the shoulder, with estimates of its length reaching up to 24 feet and weights possibly up to 20 tons. To put it simply, this creature made elephants look small. Its vast range covered parts of what is now Asia, from the Balkans through Central Asia to China. Despite its imposing size and widespread distribution, Paraceratherium, like many prehistoric species, faced extinction. However, despite being one of the most impressive land mammals to ever exist, and despite having no predators, it went extinct for reasons which are still unknown. The leading theories on the extinction of Paraceratherium revolve around climate change, habitat loss, and the resultant changes in food availability. During the Oligocene, the Earth experienced significant climatic shifts. These shifts led to the gradual replacement of the dense, lush forests they thrived in. Such a transformation in the global environment would have posed a severe challenge to the creature, which relied on large quantities of foliage from trees and shrubs to sustain its enormous body size. As forests receded, the animal's primary food source became scarcer, making survival increasingly difficult. Another critical factor contributing to the extinction of Paraceratherium was the changing geography of the Earth during this period. The formation of mountain ranges like the Himalayas, due to the Indian subcontinent's collision with Asia, significantly altered the landscape and climate of the region. These geological changes would have further disrupted the habitats of many species, including Paraceratherium, leading to fragmentation of populations and isolation of groups. Furthermore, competition for resources with other herbivorous mammals might have played a role in Paraceratherium's extinction. As the environment changed, Paraceratherium would have found itself competing with an increasing number of species adapted to the new grassland ecosystems. These species, being possibly more efficient at processing the available vegetation or better adapted to the changing conditions, could have outcompeted Paraceratherium for food, leading to its decline. Anyway, I know lots of people long for the day where hordes of cloned out woolly mammoths are trotting across Siberia again, but for me, I would love to see one of these giants in person. The Vegetable Lamb of Tartary The Vegetable Lamb of Tartary is a cryptid from medieval folklore, described as a plant-animal hybrid that grows sheep as its fruit. Originating from Central Asia, it embodies the blend of botanical and zoological elements in myth, presenting a sheep tethered to the earth by a stem. Early mentions trace back to Jewish texts and travel accounts by European explorers like Sir John Mandeville in the 14th century. They described the creature as a living plant that bore lambs as fruit, which grazed the land around them until the plant's stem broke, allowing the lamb to gain freedom, or it perished once all nearby vegetation was consumed. Theories about the vegetable lamb aim to explain the origins of cotton in medieval Europe, unfamiliar with the plant's actual cultivation. Cotton, resembling wool, fueled speculation about a plant that produced animal fleece. This narrative served as a medieval attempt to understand and categorize the natural world using the limited information available. This cryptid hasn't been cited in years, suggesting that there is no legitimate belief in the vegetable lamb of Tartary remaining in 2024. Nosferatu was portrayed by an actual vampire. This hypothesis proposes that Max Schreck, famed for his role as Count Orlok in the 1922 film Nosferatu, was an actual vampire, using the role of a vampire to cover for the fact that he was in fact a vampire. This theory, while outlandish, emerges from Shrek's intensely private life, his peculiarly convincing portrayal of a vampire, and the lack of extensive documentation about his personal and professional history prior to Nosferatu. Shrek's portrayal of Count Orlok, 
considered one of the most iconic performances in film history, would suggest that he would have a significant career after. However, he languished in obscurity. Further, Schreck's name, translating to terror in German, adds an eerie coincidence, fueling speculation about his true nature. Proponents of the theory find that Schreck's performance in Nosferatu is too authentic. Unlike theatrical portrayals common in the silent film era, his Count Orlok exhibits a disturbing realism. His physical transformation for the role, without the sophisticated makeup and special effects available today, raises questions according to this hypothesis. Interestingly, the 2000 film, Shadow of the Vampire, is based upon this idea, with the 2000 film being a fictionalized version of the making of Nosferatu, where Shrek is definitely an actual vampire. Anyway, the theory lacks credibility and is grounded in speculation and poor research rather than facts. This urban legend portrays Shrek as a complete acting novice at the time of his casting as Nosferatu. However, this couldn't be further from the truth. Max Shrek had significant stage acting experience before his iconic role in Nosferatu. Shrek was a dedicated theater actor, honing his craft in various stage productions across Germany for decades. His stage experience provided a solid foundation for his transition into film where he applied his theatrical skills to deliver the hauntingly memorable performance as Count Orlok. Further, Shrek did have a substantial career after. However, these films are much less widely known than Nosferatu, one of the most well-known movies of all time. Hats off to Max Shrek, though. Not many people can say they delivered a performance so haunting that people unironically question whether the person portraying the role is an undead being or not. If you like what you're seeing, do me a huge favor and hit the like button, the subscribe button, and that sweet notification bell. This helps my channel grow and lets me spend way more time in the kitchen cooking up content for you. Also, the Lazy Chill Zone Discord community is always growing, so hit the link in the description to join up. Also calling all chads and chadettes, join up on the Patreon or the YouTube membership both links are in the description. The 2008 Lane Bryant shooting. The Lane Bryant shooting was a harrowing event that unfolded on the morning of February 2, 2008 in Tinley Park, a suburb of Chicago. This tragic event resulted in the loss of five innocent lives. On February 2, 2008, a man posing as a delivery person entered the Lane Bryant store before store opening hours under the guise of making a delivery. Within moments, the situation rapidly deteriorated as he revealed his true intentions, turning a routine day into a nightmare for the store employees and customers present. The assailant took six women hostage, binding them with the materials he found within the store. The ordeal culminated in the execution-style slayings of five of the six hostages, leaving the nation shocked by the pointlessness and brutality of the crime. In the aftermath of the shooting, law enforcement agencies launched a comprehensive investigation, but no suspect has been named. The surviving victim was thankfully able to give a description sufficient for the police to release a sketch of the slayer. The case is still being actively investigated, with my research showing that two new investigators were put on the case in 2008. At this point, I have to suspect there is a very good chance that the killer may be incarcerated on unrelated charges. The Disappearance of Roberto Solis Roberto Solis, once known by the pen name Pancho Aguila, is a notorious criminal who disappeared under mysterious circumstances in October 1993. His criminal tale begins in 1969, when at the age of 24, Solis was convicted of slaying a security guard during a failed robbery. This violent act earned him a lengthy sentence in San Quentin State Prison, where he began to write poetry. His poetry was cited as indication of turning over a new leaf. However, despite his literary pursuits, Solis's criminal instincts were far from reformed. After serving 24 years, Solis was released on parole in 1992. 
By then, he had transformed himself into a seemingly reformed character, an artist who had supposedly turned away from his violent past. However, this facade quickly crumbled. In 1993, Solis masterminded one of the most audacious heists in Las Vegas history. Along with his accomplice and girlfriend, Heather Tall Chief, Solis stole $3.1 million from an armored car. This theft was not just remarkable for the amount stolen, but for the methodical planning and execution that left no direct traces to Solis or Tall Chief. After the heist, he and Tall Chief fled the United States, leaving behind few clues of their whereabouts. While Tall Chief resurfaced in 2005, surrendering to U.S. authorities and serving a prison sentence, Solis remained a ghost. Tall Chief went on to be paroled in 2010. She has advised authorities that she believes Solis is deceased. However, given that he's a violent criminal with a history of ending people, I suspect she may not be overly forthcoming about his potential whereabouts. The Tsavo Man-Eaters In the late 19th century, a terrifying series of events unfolded near the Tsavo River in Kenya, casting a long shadow over the region. The Tsavo Man-Eaters, a pair of maneless male lions, embarked on a gruesome spree, claiming the lives of a number of workers engaged in the construction of the Uganda Railway. At the end of the 19th century, the British Empire was endeavoring to bolster its colonial infrastructure through the establishment of a railway that would connect Uganda to the Indian Ocean, thereby facilitating trade and military movement. However, what was meant to be a symbol of technological and imperial progress soon turned into a harrowing struggle for survival for the workers involved. Over several months in 1898, the Savo man-eaters instilled fear and chaos, halting construction as they preyed upon the railway workers with alarming audacity and intelligence. Several theories have been proposed to explain the lion's unusual behavior. A common assertion points to the scarcity of natural prey due to a concurrent severe drought, pushing these predators to seek alternative food sources. Another theory suggests that an outbreak of rinderpest, a devastating cattle disease, decimated local wildlife populations, further exacerbating the situation. Another theory suggests that the lions had contracted a dental disease, which prevented them from hunting their usual prey. Also, perhaps unsurprisingly, more unusual and sensational theories were promoted by less than reputable journalistic outlets at the time. Ultimately, a British Lieutenant Colonel, John Henry Patterson, was tasked with hunting these menaces and eventually ended up slaying them both. Also, if you want to see these troublemakers today, their taxidermied bodies are on display at the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago. The Fatimid Caliph Hakim, the 6th Fatimid Caliph and 16th Ismaili Imam, vanished without a trace in 1021. Born in 985 in Cairo, he ascended to the throne at the tender age of 11. His reign, lasting over two decades, was marked by significant political, social, and religious transformations. Yet it is his enigmatic disappearance that has fueled centuries of speculation and debate. Al-Hakim's rule was characterized by its eccentricities and contradictions. He was, to say the least, not a consistent individual. He implemented progressive policies, such as founding the House of Knowledge, a key center for intellectual and cultural exchange. Conversely, his reign saw the imposition of strict and peculiar decrees, including bans on chess and the consumption of certain foods. Al-Hakim's treatment of religious minorities oscillated dramatically. He alternated between periods of tolerance and severe persecution. The night of his disappearance, Al-Hakim went for one of his customary nocturnal rides in the Mukaddam Hills near Cairo and never returned. The search for him yielded only his donkey and blood-stained garments. This abrupt vanishing act gave rise to numerous theories. Some posit that he was ended by his own sister, 
Sitt al-Mulk, who opposed his policies and subsequently assumed power as regent for her nephew. However, detractors point out that there is no evidence whatsoever to implicate her, and the transfer of power was not unusual. Others suggest he fell victim to a conspiracy by the military or by rival political factions within his empire. A more mystical theory embraced by the Druze, a religious group that reveres al-Hakim, proposes that he disappeared and will return as a messianic figure. Further, some have posited that he had become interested in mysticism and asceticism and wished to escape from the confines of the caliphate. At any rate, it seems unlikely that we will ever have a definitive answer to this mystery. Our Lady of Guadalupe Our Lady of Guadalupe holds a significant place in religious and cultural history, particularly within the context of Latin American Catholicism. In 1531, a pivotal event occurred on the hill of Tepeyac near Mexico City, marking the birth of a symbol that would unify and inspire millions for centuries to come. A poor indigenous man named Juan Diego experienced a series of apparitions of the Virgin Mary. She requested a church to be built on that site in her honor. When Juan Diego reported this to the local bishop, he was met with skepticism. In need of proof, the Virgin Mary instructed Juan Diego to gather roses from the hilltop, despite it being winter when no roses should bloom. Miraculously, he found Castilian roses, not native to Mexico, and gathered them in his tilma, a type of Aztec cloak. Upon presenting these to the bishop, the image of the Virgin Mary was miraculously imprinted on the fabric of the tilma. The Virgin Mary appearing on an indigenous cloak has been speculated to be the start of an ethnogenesis, the blending of the cultures and values of the native culture with Spanish culture. Further, the fact that it was Castilian roses, a type of Spanish rose, on an indigenous cloak makes the whole event seem very much on the nose. Several theories have been proposed to explain the origin and significance of the image. Some researchers focus on the miraculous nature of the image's survival over centuries without degradation, which contradicts the natural properties of the materials involved. Others delve into the iconography and symbolism embedded in the image, suggesting it was a strategic tool for evangelization, designed to resonate deeply with the indigenous population's beliefs and values. The historical context of the apparition is crucial to understanding its impact. The early 16th century was a period of turmoil and transformation in what is now Mexico. The Spanish conquest had led to the collapse of the Aztec Empire, and the indigenous population faced the destruction of their social, political, and religious structures. The apparition of Our Lady of Guadalupe is seen by many as a beacon of hope and a source of comfort and identity for a people struggling under the weight of harsh colonization. The tilma, with the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe, is currently housed in the Basilica of Our Lady of Guadalupe in Mexico City, one of the most visited Catholic pilgrimage sites in the world. The image has been subjected to various scientific analyses over the years, with researchers examining its properties to understand its preservation and the technique used in its creation. However, no consensus has been reached as yet. Also, whatever happened to our friend Juan Diego, who saw the Virgin Mary? Well, he went on to become the first saint indigenous to the Americas, again further confirming this event as a syncretization of the new world with the old world. The 2001 anthrax attacks. In the weeks following September 11th, the United States faced another sinister threat, the anthrax attacks. Letters containing anthrax spores were mailed to news media offices and two US senators, leading to five deaths and 17 infections. This biological assault created widespread panic and confusion, marking a critical moment in U.S. history and biosecurity policy. The first case was reported on October 4, 2001, when Robert Stevens, a photo editor for the Sun Tabloid in Florida, was diagnosed with inhalational anthrax. 
He eventually succumbed to the anthrax bacteria, becoming the first known victim. Subsequently, letters laced with anthrax were discovered in offices in New York, Florida, and Washington, D.C. The anthrax strains found in the letters were quickly linked to a specific strain, which was used in U.S. biodefense labs. This connection led investigators to focus on domestic sources, particularly scientists or individuals with access to these labs. The investigation, named Amerithrax by the FBI, became one of the largest and most complex in U.S. history. One significant aspect of the anthrax attacks was the heightened sense of vulnerability they exposed. Coming so soon after 9-11, these attacks underscored the potential for non-traditional warfare to inflict harm on civilian populations. The fear and uncertainty generated by the anthrax letters led to a surge in emergency room visits, an increase in the purchase of antibiotics, and a re-evaluation of the nation's preparedness for bio-attacks. The Amerithrax investigation initially faced significant challenges, including false leads, and a focus on a scientist named Stephen Hatfill, who was later exonerated. It wasn't until 2008 that the FBI identified Dr. Bruce Ivins, a senior biodefense researcher at the U.S. Army Medical Research Institute of Infectious Diseases, as the primary suspect. Ivins had access to the strain of anthrax used in the attacks and had been involved in the development of anthrax vaccines. However, before charges could be filed, Ivins ended himself in July 2008. The FBI declared at that point that Ivins had acted alone and that the file was closed. The FBI's conclusion that Ivins acted alone has been met with skepticism and criticism from various quarters. Most notably, individuals within the FBI itself indicated that the lack of any anthrax spores whatsoever in any area associated with him cast a great deal of doubt on the case. Some argue that the evidence against Ivins was circumstantial and that the investigation failed to explore other possible suspects or motives. Further, it's important to remember that just because Ivins ended himself, this does not constitute a confession or an admission of guilt. The extreme stress of impending charges for one of the worst attacks in American history may have led Ivans to break and end himself. Ross McDonnell The untimely death of Ross McDonnell, an acclaimed Irish filmmaker and photographer, shocked the creative world. Born in Dublin, Ireland in 1979, McDonnell was a prolific and rising figure in his field known for his exceptional skill in documentary filmmaking and photography. His notable works include co-directing documentaries such as Elian and Colony, as well as his critical role as a cinematographer in the Emmy-winning Showtime documentary series The Trade and the 2021 documentary film The First Wave. On November 5th, 2023, McDonald's life was tragically cut short at the age of 44. He was reported missing in New York City on November 4th, 2023, sparking widespread concern and a subsequent search. His body was discovered on a beach in Breezy Point, Queens on November 17th and officially identified on November 22nd. The circumstances surrounding McDonald's death have been shrouded in mystery, with initial reports suggesting no foul play. However, his body was discovered both headless and armless, leading some to question his cause of death. Police are presently working under the theory that he went out for a swim alone, something happened, and the state of his body was caused by rocks and marine life rather than foul play. The Identity of Empress Empress is a notable figure in the online world, recognized for her expertise in cracking DRM digital rights management, protections on video games. She operates anonymously, with her identity shrouded in secrecy, a common practice in the hacker and cracker communities to avoid legal repercussions and maintain privacy. Empress first gained significant attention for cracking Denuvo, a notoriously tough DRM system that many considered virtually unbreakable. 
Empress's breakthroughs not only demonstrated her advanced understanding of reverse engineering, but also her commitment to challenging the constraints of DRM technologies. Her work is often released on various online platforms, accompanied by manifestos criticizing the gaming industry's DRM practices, as well as unrelated screeds. Despite her extreme levels of knowledge and skill, the woman behind the Empress identity remains a mystery. However, it is believed she is actually one person, not a pseudonym used by a group. Further, it's believed that she resides or resided in Russia. The Wickenburg Massacre The Wickenburg Massacre unfolded on November 5, 1871, near Wickenburg, Arizona, then part of the Arizona Territory. This event involved the ambush and slaying of six passengers from a stagecoach en route from Wickenburg to Ehrenburg, Arizona. The massacre not only shocked and angered the frontier community, but also remains a subject of controversy and speculation, with various theories about the perpetrators and their motives still debated today. The stagecoach, carrying seven passengers and a large shipment of gold, was attacked approximately eight miles northwest of Wickenburg. The assailants, hiding in the brush alongside the road, opened fire on the stagecoach without warning. Six of the passengers were slain outright or mortally wounded. One passenger, a woman named Molly Shepard, survived despite being shot. She managed to escape and eventually recounted the harrowing ordeal, which helped to shape the initial understanding of the event. The immediate aftermath of the massacre saw a rush to judgment with local settlers and military authorities quickly blaming Native American groups, specifically the Yavapai. The military launched punitive expeditions against nearby Yavapai bands, exacerbating the already tense relations between Native Americans and settlers. However, the attribution of the massacre to the Yavapai was and remains a matter of contention. Some contemporaneous accounts and later historical analyses suggests that the attackers may have been motivated by the desire to rob the stagecoach of its valuable cargo. This theory is supported by the fact that the attack was meticulously planned and executed, indicating that the assailants had specific knowledge of the stagecoach's route and cargo. Another theory posits that the massacre was the result of internal conflict among settlers, or a dispute between different groups vying for control over the lucrative stagecoach routes, and the transport of gold and other valuables. This perspective suggests that the massacre was a calculated act of violence aimed at disrupting the operations of a rival faction or company, with the blame conveniently placed on the Yavapai to divert suspicion. Yet another theory holds that whatever happened, the military simply used the attack as an excuse to conduct punitive raids. The Satanic Panic the Satanic Panic was a widespread moral panic in the United States during the 1980s and early 1990s, characterized by fears of Satanic ritual abuse perpetrated by secretive cults. The hysteria was significantly driven by exaggerated reports in the media, questionable psychological techniques that led to the creation of false memories through hypnosis, and a widespread fear regarding society's moral deterioration. This period also saw the emergence of conservative Christian factions, viewing the evolving cultural landscape and new youth cultures as evidence of a demonic plot. At the heart of this frenzy were claims of mistreatment within childcare establishments, notably illustrated by the notorious McMartin preschool case. Despite an evident lack of solid proof, a prevailing belief held that children were being exposed to appalling ceremonies. This alarm spread rapidly, encompassing music, video games, and films, with specific scrutiny aimed at certain heavy metal groups and fantasy role-playing games, notably Dungeons & Dragons. There is speculation that certain individuals or entities engaging in truly vile deeds exploited the satanic panic as a smokescreen, blending genuine instances of misconduct with clear examples of fabricated recollections. 
King Sebastian of Portugal. In 1578, the young and ambitious King Sebastian of Portugal vanished in the dense fog of the Battle of the Three Kings in Morocco. This event plunged Portugal into a crisis that eventually led to the loss of its independence. Sebastian, driven by dreams of crusader glory, led an ill-fated expedition to North Africa. The crushing defeat and his subsequent disappearance left Portugal reeling. There are several theories about what happened to him. Some suggest he died in battle, his body never identified amid the carnage. Others speculate he was captured and died in captivity, or even that he managed to escape, living the rest of his life in anonymity. A more romantic theory posits that he survived and went into hiding, waiting for the right moment to reclaim his throne, a moment that never came and became increasingly unlikely with each passing year. The immediate consequence of Sebastian's disappearance led to a succession crisis that paved the way for the Spanish king, Philip II, to claim the Portuguese crown in 1580. This personal union, with Portugal very much playing the role of the junior partner, effectively initiated a 60-year period of Spanish rule over Portugal, known as the Iberian Union. This union had far-reaching consequences for Portugal. The once mighty Portuguese maritime empire, pioneers of the Age of Discoveries, began to crumble, and the ambitions of the Portuguese were subsumed to Habsburg Spain. This is one unsolved mystery that despite not being widely known, had massive consequences for the world, especially given the prominence of the Portuguese overseas empire prior to Sebastian's disappearance. The slaying of Yasuko Watanabe. The slaying of Yasuko Watanabe, a 39-year-old Japanese woman who worked as a senior economic researcher at Tokyo Electric Power Company and led a secret life as a paid companion at night, captured the attention of the nation. On March 9, 1997, Watanabe's life was tragically cut short by an unknown assailant in Harajuku, a neighborhood of Tokyo. Her body was discovered 10 days later in a vacant apartment in a nearby district of Tokyo, in an area where she was known to engage in her nightly activities. Watanabe's slaying shocked Japan and highlighted several societal issues, including the stigma associated with paid companionship work and the challenges within the Japanese criminal justice system. One of the most notable aspects of this case was the wrongful conviction of Govinda Prasad Menali, a Nepalese migrant who lived in an adjacent building to where Watanabe's body was found. Mainali became the prime suspect and was initially acquitted due to lack of evidence, but was later convicted on appeal by the Tokyo High Court and sentenced to an indefinite prison term. He spent 15 years in prison before DNA evidence emerged, proving his innocence and linking the crime to an unidentified third man. Mainali was released in June 2012, deported to Nepal, and later formally declared innocent in the matter. At present, no person of interest has been named by the police. The Ivory-Billed Woodpecker The Ivory-Billed Woodpecker is a potentially extinct bird that was once prevalent across the southeastern United States. This species is or was known for its distinctive appearance and large size. Central to the discussion on the Ivory-Billed Woodpecker is its habitat. Historically, these birds thrived in extensive mature forests, particularly those abundant in dead or dying trees. These environments were essential not only for nesting, but also for feeding, as the woodpeckers would forage for insects beneath the bark. However, the 20th century brought extensive logging operations that drastically reduced these habitats, leading to a severe decline in the bird's population. By the mid-20th century, the ivory-billed woodpecker was considered extinct, with the last confirmed sighting in the United States reported in 1944. Over the years, there have been numerous reports of sightings across the bird's historic range, particularly in Arkansas, Louisiana, and Florida, with a sighting in 2004 hitting national news. 
These accounts have sparked a series of searches and debates within the scientific community and among conservationists. The possibility that the ivory-billed woodpecker could still exist prompts a significant question. How could a species deemed extinct remain undetected for so long? One theory posits that the bird's elusive nature and preference for densely forested swampy areas make it particularly challenging to spot. The ivory-billed woodpecker's behavior, such as its high canopy dwelling and infrequent calls, further complicates detection efforts. Additionally, the similarity in appearance between the ivory-billed woodpecker and the more common woodpeckers often leads to misidentification, casting doubt on unconfirmed sightings. I hypothesize that the likelihood of rediscovering the ivory-billed woodpecker hinges on the integration of technological advancements in current search efforts. The use of high-resolution trail cameras, drones, and audio recording devices could transform the landscape of wildlife research by enabling extensive surveys of potential habitats while minimizing environmental disturbance. This approach not only enhances the efficiency of search operations, but also extends scientists' reach into previously inhospitable territories that the woodpecker prefers. The Disappearance of Le Oiseau Blanc. The disappearance of Le Oiseau Blanc, or the white bird, remains one of the most intriguing mysteries in the history of aviation. On May 8, 1927, French aviators Charles Nungesser and Francois Collet embarked on a daring attempt to make the first non-stop transatlantic flight from Paris to New York City. This venture was not just a test of human endurance and aeronautical engineering, but also a race to achieve what was then considered the ultimate feat in aviation. The plane, a Levasseur PL-8 biplane, was specially designed for the long journey, equipped with enough fuel to cover the 3,600-mile distance. Despite their experience and the plane's preparation, the two vanished without a trace. Several theories have been proposed to explain the fate of Le Oiseau Blanc. The most widely accepted theory suggests that the aircraft encountered severe weather conditions or mechanical failure over the Atlantic Ocean, leading to its crash into the sea. The vastness of the Atlantic and the era's limited search and rescue capabilities made recovery efforts futile, leaving no trace of the aviators or their plane. Another theory posits that Le Oiseau Blanc may have reached Newfoundland, or even Maine, but crashed in a remote area. Supporting this theory are numerous reports from individuals who claim to have heard or seen an aircraft matching the description during the time frame it would have been in the vicinity. However, extensive searches in these regions have failed to yield any significant concrete evidence, and these claims remain unverified. That said, in 1992, a part of a plane which could be from the Le Oiseau Blanc was discovered in Newfoundland. However, there was nothing to suggest it wasn't just from a similar model of plane. A more controversial theory suggests sabotage. The 1920s were a period of intense rivalry in aviation with significant prestige and financial rewards for record-breaking flights. Some speculate that competing interests could have led to foul play, although no evidence has substantiated these claims. In my view, given the absolute lack of any evidence in the years following this, the theory can be safely dismissed. It could have happened, yes, but there's simply nothing there to support this view. Legio Ninth Hispana, the missing Ninth Spanish Legion. The disappearance of the Ninth Spanish Legion is one of the greatest mysteries of the Roman Empire. Known as Legio Nime Hispana in Latin, this legion of the Roman Empire was reputed for its military prowess and played a crucial role in Roman conquests across Europe. However, its sudden vanishing from historical records in the early 2nd century AD has sparked a myriad of theories and speculations, making it a captivating subject for exploration. The Ninth Legion, likely existed since at least 90 BC, 
however the exact origin and formation date remains unknown. The legion distinguished itself in the Roman military campaigns, particularly during Julius Caesar's Gallic Wars. It was later stationed in Britain following the Roman invasion in AD 43, where it was instrumental in suppressing uprisings and expanding Roman territory. The last definitive record of the 9th's existence dates to the second century AD, after which it mysteriously disappears from the annals of history. Several theories have been proposed to explain the fate of the 9th Legion, each offering a different perspective based on historical evidence and archaeological findings. One prevalent theory suggests that the Legion was decimated in battle, possibly during an uprising in Britain or in conflicts on the continent, such as the Bar Kokhba revolt in Judea or in a war in Parthia in the 160s. Scholars consider the theory that the Legion was destroyed during an uprising in Northern Britain to be most plausible. Others suggest that due to administrative and clerical issues, the name of the Legion was changed at some point and it simply went under another name. From my research, I strongly prefer the theory that the 9th Spanish Legion was annihilated. My evidence for this is circumstantial, but draws from the very well-documented precedent which was set at the Battle of Teutoburg Forest. For those not aware, this was a battle in 9 AD, wherein three Roman legions were completely annihilated by a confederation of Germanic tribesmen, halting the Roman advancement into Germanic territories at the Rhine River. The 17th, 18th, and 19th legions were destroyed, and due to superstition surrounding the destructions of these three legions, the names were never assigned to any future legions. Therefore, I would posit that the 9th Spanish Legion likely met a similar fate, but perhaps due to the remoteness of battle and the lack of survivors, the battle itself is not attested in the historical record. The Slaying of Gwen Story The Slaying of Gwen Story, a 19-year-old woman from Cincinnati, Ohio, has haunted Las Vegas since her body was discovered on August 14, 1979. Known as Sahara Sioux, before her recent identification in December 2023, her case has remained a mystery for 44 years. Story was found stabbed multiple times, and despite extensive efforts, including DNA analysis and genetic testing, her killer remains unknown. Before her death, she had left Ohio with two male friends, aiming to find her biological father in California. The two male friends returned and advised Gwen Story's family that she had been left in Las Vegas. Her family never heard from her again. Police are presently seeking the two male friends for questioning in relation to Gwen Story's disappearance. This is a very recent development, and as of February 2024, there is no update as to whether these men have been tracked down or whether their identities are even known at this point. Big Jim Colosimo In the tumultuous underbelly of Prohibition-era Chicago, the slaying of James Big Jim Colosimo in 1920 marked a pivotal moment in the city's criminal history, laying the foundation for the rise of one of its most notorious gangsters, Al Capone. Colosimo the head of a sprawling vice empire that included gambling dens, houses of ill repute, and a lavish restaurant where he met his demise, was at the zenith of his power when his life was abruptly ended. Johnny Torrio, Colosimo's underboss and a formidable crime figure in his own right, is widely believed to have orchestrated Colosimo's slaying. Torrio, who had been instrumental in expanding Colosimo's criminal enterprises, saw an immense opportunity in bootlegging following the enactment of prohibition. However, Colosimo, content with his existing operations, and perhaps wary of the increased attention such a move might attract, was reluctant to venture into alcohol distribution. According to this theory, this disagreement created a rift between Torrio and Colosimo with Torrio increasingly convinced that Colosimo's reluctance threatened the future profitability and expansion of their criminal enterprise. The execution of the plot allegedly fell to Frankie Yale, a notorious hitman and Torrio's associate from New York.
Following Colosimo's death, Torrio took over the helm of the operation, with Al Capone ascending as his right-hand man. It has been theorized that Capone played a big part in the conspiracy as well. Despite the allegations presented, none of the allegedly involved parties were ever charged in relation to the slaying. The Kraken. The Kraken. A creature as mysterious as the ocean depths from which it purportedly emerges has fascinated humans for ages. Often depicted as a gigantic sea monster capable of sinking ships and devouring sailors, the Kraken's origins are deeply rooted in maritime folklore, particularly in Scandinavian mythology. One prevalent theory posits that the Kraken legend may have been inspired by sightings of giant squids. These elusive creatures, with their massive size and formidable tentacles, closely resemble descriptions of the Kraken. Before the giant squid was scientifically documented, sailors' encounters with such an astonishing creature could easily have been embellished into tales of a monstrous Kraken capable of catastrophic destruction. Another theory suggests that the Kraken stories could be based on observations of colossal squids which are even larger than their giant counterparts and possess large, menacing eyes and massive hooks on their tentacles. The colossal squid's even more imposing size and fearsome appearance could contribute to the mythological image of the kraken as an unbeatable monster of the deep. However, in my view, given the range of the colossal squid, primarily around the Southern Ocean, it isn't a good candidate for the kraken. Additionally, some speculate that the Kraken tales could have originated from exaggerated accounts of real sea animal behaviors, such as whales or large schools of fish, which could create whirlpools or sudden turbulent waters, misinterpreted by sailors as the work of a monstrous creature. Joyeuse, the legendary sword of Charlemagne. Joyeuse, the legendary sword of Charlemagne, the first Holy Roman Emperor, carries a rich tapestry of history and myth. Celebrated in countless tales and historical accounts, Joyeuse is not just a weapon, but a symbol of power and divine kingship. According to historical records, Charlemagne wielded Joyeuse in numerous battles that expanded and solidified his empire, which spanned much of Western Europe. The sword's name, meaning joyful in French, reflects its esteemed place in Carolingian lore and beyond, symbolizing victory and royal authority. The physical description of Joyeuse, as it is known today, showcases a sword of exquisite craftsmanship. The current sword, preserved in the Louvre Museum in Paris, features a hilt added in the 10th to 13th centuries with gold and precious stones suggesting modifications that reflect its continued importance through the ages. However, the authenticity of the Joyeuse housed in the Louvre has been the subject of debate among historians and arms enthusiasts. Some argue that the original blade, forged in the 8th century, could not have survived over a millennium without significant alterations or replacements. Theories propose that the current Joyeuse may be a composite of various parts assembled over the centuries, with the original components replaced or lost to time. This skepticism is fueled by the common practice in the Middle Ages of refurbishing and updating ceremonial weapons to maintain their symbolic power and aesthetic grandeur. Given the technological and material constraints of the period, as well as the sword's immense value as a regal insignia, it is plausible that Joyeuse underwent transformations that leave today's version markedly different from Charlemagne's original blade. Moreover, the lore surrounding Joyeuse, filled with miraculous feats and supernatural qualities, adds layers of myth that challenge historical veracity. The blend of fact and fiction surrounding the sword makes it difficult to discern the true history from embellished legend. The First Video Game The title of First Video Game is subject to some debate, largely because it depends on how one defines a video game. However, I would propose that a video game needs a graphical display and some element of skill or input. 
Birdie the Brain is a notable early contender in the history of video games. Created in 1950 by Dr. Joseph Katz, Birdie the Brain was one of the earliest computer games and featured a tic-tac-toe game against an artificial intelligence. This game was showcased at the Canadian National Exhibition, making it one of the first instances where a computer game was demonstrated to the public. Birdie the Brain was a massive machine, standing over four meters tall, and was designed to showcase the capabilities of vacuum tube technology. While perhaps not as widely recognized as some other early games, Birdie the Brain represents a significant step in the evolution of interactive entertainment and the use of computers for gaming, marking an important milestone in the history of video games. OXO, released in 1952, was a tic-tac-toe game developed by Alexander S. Douglas for the EDSAC computer at the University of Cambridge. This game could be played against the computer and is considered by some to be the first graphical computer game. Tennis for Two, 1958. Often considered one of the first video games, Tennis for Two was created by physicist William Higginbottom. It was a simple tennis simulation displayed on an oscilloscope screen designed for visitors at the Brookhaven National Laboratory. Space War, released in 1962 and developed by Steve Russell and others at MIT, was one of the first computer games to gain what was, for the time, considered widespread popularity. Played on a PDP-1 computer, it featured two spaceships trying to destroy each other while avoiding a central gravitational well. However, in my view, the first video game is likely lost permanently to time, as it was likely programmed for the sole usage of one computer scientist, perhaps just to test briefly how an entertaining game would work on a computer. Esther Dingley. In November 2020, the disappearance of British hiker Esther Dingley in the Pyrenees Mountains between France and Spain sparked widespread attention and concern. Esther, an experienced hiker, was on a solo trek when she vanished without a trace, leading to extensive searches and media coverage. Her case not only captivated those following her travel blog, but also ignited a flurry of theories regarding her sudden disappearance. Months of uncertainty followed until, in July 2021, a tragic discovery was made. Esther Dingley's remains were found near the location where she last communicated with her partner. Despite the closure of confirming Esther's fate, the discovery raised more questions than it answered, fueling speculation and theories about what truly happened to her on that fateful trek. One prevalent theory suggests that Esther may have had an accidental fall. The Pyrenees are known for their treacherous paths and sudden weather changes posing significant risks even to experienced hikers like Esther. This theory is supported by the fact that her remains were found in a remote area, which could indicate she veered off the main path and succumbed to a tragic accident. Another theory that emerged in the wake of her disappearance revolves around foul play. While less evidence supports this, the isolated nature of her trek and the delay in finding her remains have led some to speculate about potential encounters with dangerous individuals. Another theory, supported by her partner, is that she may have been accidentally slain by hunters active in the region, who upon having committed this tragic mistake, covered it up. The Mysterious Death of Romulus Romulus, a legendary figure, is generally hailed as the at best quasi-historical founder of Rome. According to Roman mythology, Romulus and his twin brother Remus were the sons of Rhea Silvia, a Vestal Virgin, and the god Mars. Abandoned at birth and left to die, they were miraculously saved by a she-wolf who nursed them back to health. As they grew, so did their strength and ambition, eventually leading them to the site where Rome stands today. The twins wished to establish a city, however, a disagreement over its location led to Romulus slaying Remus, thus becoming Rome's sole founder in 753 BC. Romulus's reign was marked by significant achievements, 
including the establishment of Roman institutions, laws, and society's social structure. He is credited with creating the Roman Senate, forming the first legions of Rome, and significantly expanding the city's territory through both diplomacy and warfare. Under his leadership, Rome began its journey from a small settlement to a mighty empire. One of the most intriguing aspects of Romulus's story is his mysterious disappearance. Ancient sources provide various accounts of his end, each blending history with myth, leaving his fate open to interpretation. One popular theory suggests that Romulus was taken up by a storm or whirlwind vanishing without a trace. This account often leads to the suggestion that he was deified, becoming a god. Another theory proposes that Romulus's disappearance was the result of a senatorial conspiracy. Dr. No, the Ohio Serial Slayer. This suspected serial killer's reign of terror over Ohio between 1981 and 1990 has left a dark shadow that persists to this day. Targeting women working as paid companions at truck stops and parking lots along Interstate 71, Dr. No's moniker emerged from an account of a survivor who noted that he was a regular nicknamed Dr. No. Dr. No is purported to have slain at least nine women. However, the police suspect that he is responsible for a number of other slayings. In the investigation of the Dr. No slayings, several truckers were considered suspects over the years due to their possible connections to the crimes. Alvin Wilson, a trucker from Lake County, Ohio, was scrutinized in 1991 after evidence such as hair samples and credit card receipts linked him to the slayings, alongside an assault charge from 1990. However, he was never charged. Sean Patrick Goebel, arrested in 1995 for two murders, was investigated for additional crimes in multiple states, but was ruled out as a suspect in the Dr. No cases, as he was in the Army at the time, and records proved he was stationed far from Ohio. Finally, Delmas Colvin was arrested in 2005 for the slayings of seven women working in the same profession as the Dr. No Slayer targeted. However, despite admitting to seven total slayings, he has adamantly denied involvement in these slayings. There is another theory of the case, however, and that theory is that the Dr. No slayings are not the work of a single individual, but rather the work of multiple people targeting women in a high-risk profession in the same geographic region. Our Lady of the Turning Eyes Our Lady of the Turning Eyes is a mysterious event involving a statue quote-unquote coming to life. In the year 1643, amid the chaos of the Thirty Years' War, French armies laid siege to Rottweil, a city within what is now Germany, but was then part of the Holy Roman Empire. Historical records from the Dominican Order recount how 300 townspeople gathered in devout prayer before a statue of the Madonna and Child within their church. Witnesses on November 10th of that same year reported a miraculous event. The statue's complexion turned pale its gaze lifted to the heavens before settling back on the city, and there were claims of it speaking. This remarkable event was attested by believers and skeptics alike, with both Catholics and Protestants claiming to have seen the event. Two weeks later, a further miracle occurred when the statue's face took on a reddish hue. Tears seemed to flow from its eyes, and once more, its eyes moved. Simultaneously, a decisive battle unfolded at Tutlingen nearby, where a united force of Imperial, Bavarian, and Spanish soldiers overwhelmingly defeated the French, relieving the siege. The miraculous turn of events in Rottweil, coupled with this military triumph, was attributed to the divine intervention of the Virgin Mary. Some have speculated the incident was a collective delusion, a mass hysteria event brought on by the extreme stress associated with the chaos of the Thirty Years' War. Others have suggested that it was a legitimate miracle witnessed before hundreds. If you've enjoyed this video, I ask that you do me a huge favor. 
and like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. I'm constantly cooking up new content for you to enjoy. Also, if you want to be a true Chad or Chadette, join the Patreon or Lazy Chill Zone YouTube membership club and check out the Discord. The links are in the description. Shout out to my patrons Noah Schubert, Kazak Cutie, and Kurt the Squirt. Until next time, stay healthy and peace out.